So in this video, we are going to discuss about interest rate risk. So we will first look at what is an interest rate risk for a company. Interest rate risk relates the sensitivity of profit and cash flows to the changes in the interest rate risk. So what happens is uh, for even a small change, assume that a company has issued a lot of debt and they are also paying a lot of interest. So even for a small change in the interest rate, the company has to pay a very high amount or a lower amount than the normal one and that leads to sensitivity of profit. We will take an example of two companies, company A and company B. We will take profit before interest and tax as 100 here, again as 100 for this company and the interest is 50 for this company and it's only like 10 for this company. So the profit before tax would be 50 for this and 90 for this company. Assume the interest rate is going to change. Okay. So interest is going to change by 10% uh, for both the companies. So how much it's going to rise by 10%. So the 100 will be the same, but the interest will become 55 here and the profit will fall to, fall to 45. For this company, it will be 100. If the interest rises by 10%, it will be 11 here and the profit will be still 89. If you see the difference here, the difference is 5 rupees here and it is only like 1 rupee here. So what happens is, this tells that the company A has a high amount of interest rate risk. Interest rate risk is faced by companies with floating and fixed rate debt. So it doesn't matter whether the company has a fixed rate uh, debentures or a floating rate debentures. Okay, Any debt that the company has will lead to interest rate risk. Interest rate risk is a risk of change in the interest rates and the effect that this will have on profits and cash flows. This type of risk is the greatest for organizations with large amounts of assets that yield interest or liabilities on which interest is payable. So it is not only company that has that is like issuing a lot of debentures that are going to be affected by interest rate risk. It is also companies which have a large amount of assets that yield interest. So assume that a company has a lot of uh, uh, reserves and all these reserves are being like uh, uh, deposited in uh, debentures or bonds. So even a change in that interest rate, uh, what would happen it will affect the income pattern of the company here. So it's not only the company which has uh, debt in the terms of bonds. Okay, it is also a company which has investment in terms of bonds. Okay, so it affects both kind of companies. Banks and investment institutions are heavily exposed to interest rate risk, but also companies with large borrowings. So it also affects companies who invest also who borrow so it affects both kinds of companies so that's about the interest rate risk so now we look at what is a floating interest rate debt the most common form of interest rate risk faced by a non bank company is the volatility of cash flows associated with the high proportion of floating rate interest debt so for again we'll take two companies so we take company a and we take company B. So both companies have a profit before interest and tax of 100 and 100. And the interest rate for this company. So this company has uh, issued a floating rate interest. A floating rate interest. That is the floating rate usually keeps changing from year to year. So they have around. Uh, they have issued a 100 rupee bond. And they are going to pay something like 10 percent out of it so 10 rupees is the interest here and the profit before tax works around 90 so this company company b has issued a fixed rate of loan so that means they also are going to pay 10 percent of interest so that also comes to 10 so they also have the same ppt of 90 see the problem arises when the interest rate is going to change in a floating interest rate the interest rate is periodically reset for example once in a year once in six months or once in three months so what would happen is even though the company earns 100 the interest might change to 
from 10% it might go to even 11%. So what happens is this might become 11 and the profit will become 89. For a company B, as it is the same fixed rate, whatever is going to be changing in the floating rate will not affect the fixed rate. So it will have the same 10. So what would happen is the 90 will always be 90. But here in a floating interest rate, the interest rate will keep changing and it might become even to 89. It's not that it will go to the worst part. It might even become a better. For example, uh, the interest rate might also fall in uh, floating interest. So it can also become 9. So what would happen is now when the interest rate falls, the company will be earning a little bit higher. So which one is better? Company A has a fluctuating interest rate. Company B has a fixed interest rate. Fixed interest rate gives you a calmness because you know like what is going to happen. You are going to pay for, for example 10% as the interest for the next 5 years also. But in floating rate you are going to pay a different different rate for even a 5 year loan. So every time every year if the interest is going to be reset you are going to pay a different amount of interest. If it is going to become 9 you are happy but if it becomes if it becomes 11% you have to worry. So that is about the floating interest rate. Interest rates are periodically reset at every 3, 6 or 12 months. So floating rate interest rate has to be like periodically reset. So once in every 3 months or 6 months or 12 months, the rate would be like changed and a new rate would be issued. The company which has borrowed has to pay the new interest rate only. Interest rates on this debt will rise and fall in line with changes in a reference interest rate such as the bank's rate or the London Interbank offered rate which is called as the LIBOR. So the periodical resetted floating rate depends upon some other reference rate called as the LIBOR rate. The specific interest rate for every company depends upon its risk profile. Specific interest rate equals to the reference interest rates that is the LIBOR plus or minus the company's risk. For example, if company A borrows loan, they have to pay LIBOR interest, which is a general interest, plus the company specific company specific risk also. So, for example, LIBOR might be like 10% and the company specific risk can be like 5%. So, together it will be 15%. But if company B is going to borrow a LIBOR, a LIBOR based loan, the LIBOR will be the same 10% but the company specific risk can be like 2%. So the interest rate for each and every company in floating rate will differ depending upon the company's risk nature. So now we look at what is a fixed interest rate debt. A company with a high proportion of fixed interest rate debt has a commitment to fixed interest rate payments. So you might think that a company which has a fixed interest rate is much more calm, is much more safe when compared to a company which is like uh, having a floating interest rate. The answer is not like that. Even if a company has a fixed interest rate debt, still it has, it faces a lot of risk. For example, we will take like again two companies. So company A, which is our company and our competitor, our competitor whose company B. Okay. So again, we'll have the same PBIT. We have the PBIT of 100, 100, and then we'll have the interest. So our company, what they do is they have a fixed interest rate. They have a fixed interest rate of 10% on 100. So they're going to pay 10 rupees, whatever is going to happen. So our company is going to have 90 rupees as the PBT. But if you take our competitor company, they are going to pay interest but on a floating terms on a floating terms so on floating terms they pay 10 percent on 100 so they are also like us pbt of 90. so what is the problem if you are going to pay a fixed interest the problem does not occur from our side but our competitor side assume the floating rate interest is moving from 100 10 percent to around some 8 percent what would happen the interest they pay will not be 10, it will become 8. The profit that they will earn will become 92. So again, what is the problem here? The problem is the company now 
earns two rupees extra when compared to us. So again, what is the problem? The problem is this two rupee income that they get, they might give this as this two rupee as discount to the customer, to the customer. So effectively, if they give the two rupees to the customer as a discount, the company will earn only 90. It's the same 90 as what we had. Okay, but what they have in uh, addition to us is their selling price would have been reduced. Their selling price is effectively reduced by 2. So, come. So what would happen is customers will move away from us to them. Okay, but even though this is not like a permanently like possible, but because the floating interest rate will keep on changing, it might even go to from 8% to 11%. At that time, we will have a competitive edge over them. But assuming that the interest rate, the interest rate moves like this, we have a fixed interest rate of 10% and they have also starting at 10%. But over a period of years, the, the floating rate falls down. Okay, it starts at 10% but falls to something like 5%. So, when compared to company A, company B gets an advantage over a period of 5 years. So, that is a major problem for the company here because the com competitor B has a floating interest rate and the interest rate over a period of time falls down but we are now stuck with the fixed rate commitment where we have to pay 10% irrespective of whatever happens to the floating interest rate. So the fixed interest rate is also a kind of problem but it is not a direct problem to a company it is only an indirect problem to the company. If interest rates fall sharply, the company will suffer from a loss of competitive advantage compared with companies using floating in rate borrowing whose interest costs and the cost of capital will fall. So if an interest rate falls very sharply, it doesn't hurt us because we are already in, it will not benefit us because it, we are already in fixed interest rate, but it will lead us to a loss of competitiveness because that company or competitor his interest cost falls and his cost of capital now effectively falls. So what happens is it leads to loss of competitiveness. This means that a company with a fixed rate debt has exposure to interest rate risk just as a company with a floating rate debt is exposed to interest rate risk. So it's not, it doesn't matter whether you have fixed rate debt or floating rate debt. A company if they have debt, they are exposed to fixed interest rate, they are exposed to interest rate risk. So we will start with the ne next risk, it is called as asset and liability management. Fixed interest rate for payments or earnings may have different maturity time scales. Asset and liability management aims to achieve similar duration for payments and earnings. For example, a business has a 10 year loan on a building at a fixed rate of 5% per year. So a company has a building with a 10 year loan and it pays a fixed rate of 5% per year. So now this company, it rents out the building for 6 years at an interest rate of 7%. This is fine for 6 years, but then if the rental yield falls to 4% per annum, the business will start to lose money. So what happens here is the company has bought a building at a 10 year loan okay, at a interest rate of a 10 year loan okay, at a interest rate of 5%. So this is their expense but they also have an income. They also have an income. The income works for 6 years and the income is going to be 7%. So the company effectively earns 2% as their income. For 6 years it is okay, but what would happen after the 6 years? If the interest yield falls after the 6 years, okay, for the next 2 4 years, if the interest yield falls to something like 4%, the company will negatively earn 3%. So that would be the problem here. So that is called as asset and liability management. So the company has to, so what should the company do? The company should enter into a 10 year lease, okay, at a 7% or at even 6.5 is okay. So the company should effectively enter into a 10 year lease 
10 year lease at an interest rate of 6.5 percent okay so that what would happen is the asset liability is now matched a safer option would have been to match the loan period to the rental period so that's what we discussed just now so the next is so the next risk is called as gap exposure gap analysis is based on the principle of grouping together assets and liabilities which are sensitive to interest rate changes according to their maturity dates two different types of gaps may occur a negative gap where the liabilities are higher than the assets so what happens is a company has a both the interest rate asset and the liability which is based on an interest rate so sometimes the liabilities are more than the assets so if the interest rate goes up or down it hurts one part of the equation a lot when compared to the other a negative gap occurs when a firm has a larger amount of interest sensitive liabilities maturing at a certain time or in a certain period than it has interest sensitive assets the difference between the two amounts indicate the next exposure so we'll have like this the company has 10 crore of loan and the company also has uh, 5 crore of investment investment in debt okay in bonds or something so in net effect what happens is now they have a 5 crore of liability mismatch so this liability mismatch becomes a gap exposure so the gap exposure is negative because the liability the liability is higher when compared to the asset when compared to the asset so this leads to an exposure of a, a higher amount of liabilities compared to the assets but you can also think in this terms this helps in the netting of the asset and liability the company doesn't need to take a uh, hedging for this and a hedging for this okay they don't need a hedging for 15 crore they just need a hedging for the 5 crore because only the 5 crore is not is an unhedged position the 15 the 10 minus 5 okay it is like naturally hedged the other 5 alone is has to be like hedged externally so that is about the risk exposure a positive gap where the liabilities are lower and the assets are higher so the liabilities are lower and the assets are higher in that term it's called as a uh, positive gap that is a positive gap if the amount of interest sensitive assets maturing in a particular time exceeds the amount of interest sensitive liabilities maturing at the same time so even if a company wants to hedge this position they can still hedge but after netting both these numbers they can hedge the remaining amount so we look at another risk which is called as the basis risk it may appear that a company which has sized matched assets and liabilities and is both receiving and paying interest may not have any interest rate exposure for example a company has a 5 crore 5 crore worth of uh, of loan okay and they also have 5 crore of of investment okay so both these positions are hedged okay and there's no gap exposure but the problem he says is if they are not going to be like having the same maturity dates okay if they are not going to be having the same maturity date then there's going to be a problem for example the five year loan for five years okay and the five year investment is for 15 year investment now will the interest rate for both the loans for both the instruments will they move in the same is accordingly the answer is no however the two floating rates may not be determined using the same basis or benchmark so one can be in libor okay the other can be in mumbai interbank offer rate mibor so the loan can be based on one reference rate and the investment can be based on another reference rate for example one loan may be linked to one month libor and the other might be linked to a another six month libor so even though it is going to be the same libor 
okay the duration can can change the duration of the loan can change and that can be a problem so we'll still look at what is basis risk so if you look at this uh, diagram you will see that uh, this is a blue color line is a one month LIBOR and the green color line is a six month LIBOR so you might clearly see the blue line to be different than the green line the blue line is somewhere here the green line is somewhere here so everywhere you look the blue line is always lower than the green line so even though uh, assume that and this one month LIBOR is a loan and the six month LIBOR is the asset so you might see that the loan in the loan interest and the asset interest will not change exactly so if you put that the loan interest is five percent and the asset in eight percent okay so suddenly they change okay so what happens is the loan interest rises by two percent it adds by two percent and it becomes a seven percent but here also we can't expect the same two to be added somewhere it can be added by three percent so this might become a 11 percent so it's not that they will change exactly as the same number they might change with a different number and may give a different answer so even though you are like your asset is equal to your liability your interest rate asset is equal to interest rate liability this is matched so there is no gap exposure even though there is no gap exposure as the loan interest rates are in different maturity times or they have a, a different reference rate they will not change in the same manner thereby it might not offer you a hedge so in this slide we will be like discussing about yield curve the term structure of interest rates refer to the way in which the yield on a security varies according to the term of borrowing the interest rate for different maturities of a debt can be shown graphically in a yield curve normally the longer the term to maturity the higher the rate of interest this is shown by the normal yield curve in the diagram occasionally interest rates may be higher for short term maturities than long term maturities when this happens there is a negative yield curve which is also illustrated in the diagram below so we look at what is an yield curve so yield curve is uh, is a representation like this on one axis you have the term to maturity for example you might have a one year maturing bond and you might have a 10 year maturing bond and what does the interest the rate of interest for that one year bond in the market okay so normally what they uh, indicate is the the shorter duration bonds have a lower interest rate and the longer duration bond has a higher interest rate so usually the interest rate will be like uh, going upwards with the nature of the time with time so the higher the time higher will be the interest rate and lower the duration of the bond lower will be the interest rate but occasionally what happens is the longer term interest rate can be below can be below the short term interest rate so this is called as the downward sloping yield curve so there are like different types of yield curves for example if you take uh, this to be a one year bond and another 10 year bond so you can see here the interest rate is always flat uh, yield curve can also be like this if you take this bond it has a one year yield which is lower and the interest rate for a 10 year bond is much more higher and this is called the normal curve in this diagram we see that the one year interest rate for a bond is higher than the 10 year interest rate and this is called the inverted yield curve or it can also be called as a negative yield curve this is another yield curve where the one year bond is lower and for the five year bond the interest rate is higher and for the 10 year bond it is again the interest rate is lower here so it can also be that 
in different term structures okay the yield curve can go up and down so there are like uh, different shapes and uh, yield curve can take why interest rates differ for different maturities so we just now saw that uh, uh, for a one year loan okay for a one year loan the interest is lower and if you take a five year loan the interest rate is higher so this is like expressed through the normal normal yield curve but why does this occur to explain this phenomena there are like different theories the first theory is called as liquidity preference theory the liquidity preference means investors prefer having cash now to deferring the use of cash by lending it or investing it uh, we can explain this through an example uh, for example you give your friend asks you a loan your friend asks you a loan and he asks you an amount of 1 lakh and this 1 lakh is for one month now will you charge him any interest the answer is no it's very like a very short period okay we just want a zero percent assume that the same friend instead of asking you a one month loan he's asking a one lakh loan for five years so what happens is will you charge the same zero percent interest the answer is no now you feel it is little bit risky to give it to him and you might say or you might ask something like a 10 percent loan okay or he says i will i'll your friend says so if you feel risky i'll give some gold jewels at my home to you and you give me the loan so even at that point of time you will feel that okay as i'm getting golds as a collateral or as a pledge what i'll do i'll reduce my interest rate to five percentage okay so earlier you were the same person who offered him one lakh at zero percent interest but now you are trying to charge him a five percent interest okay why does this happen because you feel in five year time anything can happen your friendship can break he can become poor or uh, he might run away with your money might even die in that period so there is a risk of the money not getting returned back so the risk is always higher in the longer run the risk is higher in the longer run but the risk always lower in the shorter run so the risk is what determines the interest here the same logic we can also apply to a company you take a company and they want to give a loan okay so you take a company and they want to give a loan a one year loan to another company and there's also a five year loan to another company in one year the chance of bankruptcy bankruptcy is lower but in five years time the same bankruptcy is higher in nature so the risk is lower in the shorter duration in one year time the company might not be closed but in a longer five year time there might be a chance that the companies can get closed okay as the risk is lower you will charge a lower interest rate as the risk is higher you will charge a higher interest rate so if you look at here the one year loan that is why it is having a lower interest rate and the five year loan that is why it is having a higher interest rate so the in between data is the logic for why one year loan is lower and the five year loan is having a high interest rate so investors also prefer having cash sooner to having cash later the sooner the cash the better so they also prefer the cash to be of a low duration loan they therefore want compensation in the form of a higher interest higher return for being unable to use their cash now so they want cash immediately if the cash is not available then they will only ask for a much more higher interest rate the required return increases with the length of time for which the cash is unavailable because of this long term interest rates such as bond yields tend to be higher than short term yields and the yield curve slopes upwards so it is purely for the basis of liquidity so people want more liquidity and liquidity is given more preference the higher the liquidity lower the interest rate and the longer the period of loan the lower the liquidity hence the higher interest so if you see without liquidity premium the curve might even be flat 
but as investors in uh, uh, the market wants a premium so what they do is they want a higher they charge a higher amount of interest for the longer duration of time the liquidity preference theory has a drawback the this theory cannot explain the any other other uh, yield curve for example we have other yield curves like uh, the negative yield curve or the humped yield curve or the flat yield curve these curves cannot, cannot be explained by the liquidity preference theory because the theory states that people will always want a higher return for the longer duration of time so if liquidity preference theory correctly states this it cannot state this or this or this so that is the drawback of liquidity preference theory why interest rates differ for different maturities we look at a second theory it's called as a expectation theory expectation theory states that interest rates reflect expectations of future changes in interest rates uh, so in this theory they feel that the markets have expectation of what would be the future interest rate and according to that only the current interest rate keeps changing so it works like this so if you feel the price of potato okay in in 5 days time in 5 days time it's going to become like 100 rupees but the today's price today's the same potato's price is around some 20 rupees what would happen the next day the price will go to 40 okay in the next one day it will go to 40 the next day in the second day it will go to something like 60 in the third day it will go to something like 80 the fourth day it will go to 90 and in the fifth day it will go to 100 because that is what you are expecting okay you are expecting the price to be 100 rupees in the five days time so the price gradually keeps climbing and it reaches the 100 so this is what is called as expectations theory the interest rates are expected to rise in the future the yield curve will slope upwards so if interest rates are the current interest rate is here okay and in the future it is going to be here means the interest rate will be like this so it is an upward or a normal yield curve but if interest rates are expected to drop it can also like fall to the inverted or negative yield curve so it can be a negative yield curve okay this theory can explain whatever like different types of uh, yield curves are so it does not only like explain the normal yield curve because the earlier liquidity preference theory can explain only the normal yield curve but this expectation theory can explain any yield curve because it is only the expectation which determines the yield curve so it can be easily explained by this theory when interest rates are expected to fall short term rates may be higher than long term rates and the yield curve can be downward sloping thus the shape of the yield curve gives an indication about how interest rates are expected to move in the future so how the yield curve like shapes out that is what the marketing market is also expecting the interest rate to move so we will move on to the next theory the next theory is called as market segmentation theory market segmentation theory of interest rate suggests that the slope of the yield curve will reflect conditions in different segments of the market this holds that the major investors are confined to a particular segment of the market and will not switch segment even if the forecast of the likely interest rate changes so we look at the picture so this theory says that every duration of loan are a different kind of segments or markets okay so there are like uh, buyers and sellers in this small segment for example a one year loan segment and there are also like buyers and sellers in the five year segment and there are also like buyers and sellers in a 10 year loan segment so there are like different types of buyers in each segment so each of them will going to determine the supply and demand and they form a point so each of them determine a small point but only when you add these points you get the normal yield curve okay assume the five year interest rate is the supply demand is going to be pointed here 
and the 10 year loan is going to be pointed here what would happen if you point mark that's all the points it comes to a negative negative yield curve so again market segmentation theory can explain any type of yield curve so it can it can explain a flat curve a upward sloping a downward sloping or a humped yield curve so the yield curve is only is not a single line it is actually a different types of markets and each in each market there are like different buyers and sellers their interaction is only like determining a single point okay only when we connect the points we get the yield curve that is called as the market segmentation theory so the interest rate is also affected by the government's policy of keeping interest rates relatively high may have the effect of forcing short term interest rates higher than the long term rates similarly a government may have a policy of very low short term interest rates in the usa or eurozone or the uk the central banks are responsible for managing short term interest rates through the rates at which the central bank lends to the banks so even the government policy can affect it for example if the government is if the normal interest rate is here okay short term interest and the long term interest is somewhere here so the curve is a negative sloping curve what the government can do is the government will start to sell a lot of will try to buy a lot of bonds from this market the one year short term market as the government buys bonds as the government buys bonds okay what happens is the bond will move to the government and the cash will move to the market as now there is a lot of amount of cash in the market the interest rate will start to fall the interest rate will start to fall now the curve can even be a flat curve or if the government is very aggressive it can also be a normal curve so the government has the power to convert any curve so that is what is like told here so what are the various factors affecting the interest rates in an economy need for a real return so every investor wants a return which is adjusted for inflation or return after inflation so that is what real return refers to inflation the interest rate is also determined based upon the inflation in a country uncertainty about future rates of inflation liquidity preference of investors balance of payment or deficit in the government's account monetary policy of the government these are the factors which determine the interest rate in an economy so we will see a quiz in relation to the term structure of interest rates which what is an inverted yield curve an inverted yield curve is something like this so it's not an upward sloping it is not u shaped it is a, a downward sloping it's not horizontal okay. so the answer should be b the answer is b we will move on to our next question which of the following statement is correct government may raise interest rate so the level of expenditure in the economy will increase if you increase the interest rate the level of expenditure in the economy will fall it will not increase so this is wrong normal yield curve slopes upward yes to reflect increasing compensation to investors for being unable to use their cash now this is correct and this is explained by liquidity preference theory the yield on long term loans is lower than the yield on short term loans yes this is correct because long term debt is less risky no this is not less risky it's actually more risky for a company than a short term debt this sentence is correct but this explanation is wrong so the answer is wrong expectation theory states that future interest rates reflect expectations of future inflation rate movement it's not future inflation rate movement it is future interest rate movement so the answer is wrong so the answer should be b the answer is b we 
have another quiz. So the following statements are correct. The general level of interest rates is affected by investors' desire for a real return. Yes, because investors want a real return. Market segmentation theory can explain kinks or discontinuities in the yield curve. So, what is a kinks? Kinks works like this. The interest rate is we normal. The normal yield curve will be like this, or an inverted yield curve can be like this. King the curve is something like this. Short term might be lower, the medium term might be higher, and the long term might be lower. So this is a king the curve. So market expectation theory can explain the king the curve. The answer is yes, because it divides the market into segments: the short term segment, the medium term segment, and the long term segment. Each segment is a different market, so it can explain any yield curve when interest rates are expected to fall. The yield curve could be sloping downwards. The answer is yes. When interest rates are expected to fall, the yield curve will also fall. So all the three are right. So the answer should be D. The answer is D.